الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله we begin by praising allah We praise him, we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness. And we take refuge. We take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of Allah, the slave of Allah and he is the final messenger of Allah. My dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> what I want to talk to you today about is a reflection of a very beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and I really want you please to try and remember this, and even more important, I want you to try and act upon it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You will not enter paradise until you believe. You will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. You will not enter paradise until you believe and you will not believe until you love one another. In this hadith, my brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear that the connection between the Muslims must be a connection of love. We must love one another. And if we don't have this love for each other, if we don't have this concern for each other, if we don't have this compassion for each other, if we don't have that, then we don't truly believe. It's very similar to what the Prophet ﷺ also said, that none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. None of you, my dear brothers and sisters, truly believe until you love for your Muslim brother and for your Muslim sister, until you love for them the good things which you love for yourself. If you don't have that quality, that you prefer your Muslim brother and sister to yourself, or at least that you love for them what you love, and you want for them what you want, and you desire for them what you desire, then you don't truly believe. Your iman, your faith is deficient. And there are many things like this in Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, that the reality of iman, the reality of faith, the reality of what it means to truly believe in Allah, 
does not mean that we merely believe that Allah exists. Or simply that we have the right belief concerning Allah in His names and attributes. Or even that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without any shirk. But there are things that stem from this belief. There are things that are necessitated by this belief. If we truly know who is Allah, and this in reality is the purpose of our existence. This is the explanation. This is the meaning of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ that we have not created the human beings and the jinn except to worship us. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, it means to know Allah. It means to know Allah. When you know Allah, when you know Allah, when you know your Lord, one of the things that will become clear to you is that Allah loves, Allah loves the people of Iman. Allah loves the people who submit to Him and surrender to Him and worship Him alone. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said that none of you will come close. There is no way or no means through which we can draw close to Allah. Except through those things that Allah has made an obligation upon us. There is no way to come close to Allah except through those things which Allah has made an obligation upon us. And then a person increases, they do extra deeds. They increase upon those obligations. They do the sunnah mu'akkada, they do the nawafil, they do the extra deeds and through this, a person becomes even closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we come close to Allah. This is the means of approach to Allah. This is the wasila. This is the means of approach between us and Allah. Ours is not a deen where we worship the dead people and call upon saints and call upon the Prophet or the Prophets. We don't believe that this is the way that we become close to Allah. No, we become close to Allah by worshipping Him alone. And by doing those deeds that Allah has obligated upon us and increasing on those things. And when we do that, this is how we become close to Allah. This is how we reach closeness to Allah. And when Allah loves someone, my brothers and sisters, think about this, please think about this. Imagine this, when Allah loves someone, Allah says to Jibreel, O oh Jibreel, I love such and such person. And then Jibreel tells the angels, Allah loves such and such person. And then the angels start to tell the creatures, on the earth that Allah loves such and such person until the love of this person is established upon the earth. My brothers and sisters, that is why we should make dua. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should beg and plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, make me of those People who love you. Make me of those who love you. And cause those people who love you to love me. And cause me to love those people who love you. And cause me to love the deeds that will cause you, O oh Allah, to love me. What could be more beautiful? What could be more greater? What could be a more beautiful blessing in your life than Allah loves you and that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if you love Allah, if you love Allah, you will love the people whom Allah loves. If you love Allah, you will love the people whom Allah loves. And who does Allah love? 
Does he love the wicked? Does he love the transgressors? You know, subhanAllah, this matter of love, it is so amazing. I remember I gave a talk on this very topic of Allah and love. And when I began to research it, I discovered something. It wasn't I discovered it, but I rediscovered it. Most of the time, you don't find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah hates this person or Allah hates that person. No, most of the time it says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ For example, Allah does not love those people who make partners with Him. Allah does not love the Farsiq. Allah does not love the ungrateful one. Allah does not love the sinner. Allah does not love the tyrant. Allah does not love the oppressor. Because the, the most sad thing, the most terrible thing, is that you should be deprived of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He does not love you. And that you do not have love in your heart for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this matter of unity, my brothers and sisters, between the Muslims, if you look and you examine and you think about it deeply, it goes back to love. Love for Allah. Love for the people of Allah. Love for the friends of Allah. Love for those people who obey Allah and follow His guidance. And that is where this unity springs from. That is where this unity comes from. It comes from this love that we must have between each other. And if I go back to that hadith, if I go back to the hadith that I started with, you will not enter paradise until you believe. Okay, I want to know, who wants to go to paradise? Hands up, who wants to go to paradise? That's all of you, right? Alhamdulillah. We all want to go to paradise, right? Okay. But unless we believe, we won't get there. And and unless we love each other, we will not get there. Do you know, and the Prophet ﷺ, in this same hadith, he went on to say, and shall I tell you how to increase the love between one another? Of course they said, yes Rasulullah, because they, the Sahaba, they, this is vital. We want to go to paradise, we need to love each other. How can we increase the love between each other? And you know what the Prophet wasallam said? What do you think it was? Increase the giving of salams. Subhanallah. <laughs> Saying, Assalamu alaikum. And you know what, my brothers and sisters, it's one of the signs of the day of judgment. It's one of the signs of the last day that a person will only give salams to someone they know. They will only give salams to someone they know. But this giving of salams, Assalamu alaikum, may Allah, because that is one of the names of Allah, Assalam means peace and security. Allah is the giver of peace and security. May Allah be with you. May the giver of peace and security be with you. And you should reply as you know, with equal, and if not equal, better is better. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And how much should you give salams? You want to know how much you should give salams? If you are walking on a path, you are walking on a path and a rock divides you and you meet each other again, then when you meet each other again, you should say again, Assalamu alaikum. You leave the room, you should say Assalamu alaikum. When you come back in the room, you say Assalamu alaikum. There are the etiquettes of who gives salams to who. The standing gives one to the sitting. The one that is riding gives the salams to the group that is sitting. These are the etiquettes of saying assalamu alaikum. And the best one amongst us is the one who gives salams first. This is just 
Something so simple, my brothers and sisters. So simple. Yet you find the Muslims, we don't say salams. I was sitting just now in Tim, just, it just crossed my mind this actually, it's a bit sad. I was sitting in Tim Hortons, the Canadian institution, which is now owned by America. Or they, what, the Canadians bought it back again? Really? Okay. See, one of the, one of the good sides of the credit crunch, you know, it's like, so this Tim Hortons, uh, it's one of the nice things I love. When I come to Canada, it's like my mind starts thinking, you know, double-double. <laughs> right? I don't know. I wouldn't drink it anywhere else. I, I'm sure if I drank it in England, I wouldn't even like it. But here, I don't know. It's something special, you know. So I was sitting, and you know, mashallah, lots of brothers and sisters coming in who obviously are attending the conference, but I didn't hardly hear anyone saying, Assalamu alaikum to anyone. I mean, that just came to my mind now. I mean, I was as guilty. I'm th- Why, brothers and sisters? That's not, you see a Muslim, say assalamu alaikum and say it like you mean it. Because you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you won't believe until you love one another. How can we have forgotten this? This is the basic etiquette of the Muslim. When you see a Muslim, you should say, Assalamu alaikum. Umar ibn al Khattab, you know why he used to go to the marketplace, even though the marketplace is where shaitan flies his flag. Shaitan flies his flag in the marketplace. Yet Umar used to go there. Why? Because he could increase in giving salams to people. That's he used to go there specially, just so he could give more salams. A simple thing. But this is our deen, my brothers and sisters. A deen that teaches unity. A deen that establishes unity amongst us as one of the most important and fundamental and essential aspects of this deen. And the sharia takes so many steps to promote unity amongst the Muslims. And it has so many things to prevent disunity amongst the Muslims. And this issue of unity is something that has been emphasized by Allah in the Qur'an, by the Prophet ﷺ. We have been emphasized this importance of unity. And we hear people talk, and I know brothers and sisters, most of you, most of you sitting here today, you are sick and tired of disunity. You are sick and tired of the di- different jama'at and the different hizbs and the different parties and the different groups bickering and arguing amongst each other about things that you perceive to be petty and insignificant. The people are divided along the lines of tribe, along the lines of color, along the lines of language. Even more absurd and even more ridiculous. It's insane. I think we Muslims are in a collective state of psychosis because we're proud to belong to a country that was a map drawn by the non-Muslims 40, 50 years ago. How insane is that? Zindabad, Pakistan. Zindabad, Pakistan. Pakistan is a country that was put there by the British. Maps drawn on the line, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, lines drawn on maps by the French, by the Italians, by the British, dividing us up into nations. And now we are screaming fanatically, rallying behind some flag that didn't even exist a hundred years ago, ready to fight for it and die for it. This is madness. This is sickness. This is something so far removed from what Allah revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's nothing but his beer. It's nothing but another form of tribalism, of partisan spirit. About which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, whoever calls for asabiyah, Whoever calls for tribalism, 
and whoever fights for a sabia for tribalism then they call and they fight and they die the death of jahiliya they die and they fight and they call for the death of ignorance the time of ignorance yet these are the lines upon which we are divided nationalistic lines tribalistic lines sectarian lines yet allah warned us in the quran many times in the quran about the danger of dividing into sects and groups indeed he said allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as for those people who divide their deen into sects the meaning of which is as for those people who divide their deen into sects you have nothing to do with them in the least their reckoning is with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the quran allah likened those people who divide the religion into sects and into groups he likened them to the mushriks and indeed it is one of the quality and the sifat and the attributes of disbelievers that they divide the deen into sects they divide the religion into group into groups each each one rejoicing in the part that is with them and this is the danger brothers and sisters we don't have a holistic approach to our religion we don't have a holistic approach to the quran we approach many people and this is how the groups they form they have an idea they have a concept and instead of subjecting their concept to the quran and the sunna to see does my concept agree with the revelation or not does my idea agree with the revelation or not does this fit in to the teaching and the seera and the sunna of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam no what they do is they here's my idea now let me find some verse to justify it let me find some hadith to justify my idea can you see the difference because believe me brothers and sisters you come up with any you can think of anything and i will find a verse in the quran or a hadith of the prophet which i can twist it out of context to justify what i want to do I mean I can't think of a better example than this right now that's so relevant that the madness the madness the madness that is taking place now in the name of Islam the suicide bombing the killing of women and children the death of hundreds of thousands of innocents women children people going by their business in marketplaces being killed being murdered murdered in the name of Islam because some person had an idea an idea they borrowed from the Tamil Tigers and then they thought this looks like a good military tactic let me find something to justify it but we had nothing like this in our history before this is how you come this is how you change the deen this is how we become divided and when uh, we all know the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said fatasimu bi habli lahi jami'an wa la tafarraqu we all know fatasimu bi habli lahi jami'an this is the verse that is quoted again and again and again to remind us that we need to be united fatasimu bi habli lahi hold on together to the rope of Allah bi habli la jami'an all together wa la tafarraqu and don't be divided we all have heard this verse quoted and quoted but let's ask a question what is habli la what is the rope of Allah because Allah tells us to hang on to something a specific thing and the thing that Allah tells us to hang on to is the rope of Allah the rope of Allah so if there is a rope and this is Allah's rope we have been told all of us to hang on to that now let me ask you a question if this rope is Allah's rope and we're hanging on to it and someone lets go of Allah's rope to hang on to another rope and imagine all the people hanging on to Allah's rope they leave Allah's rope to hang on to another rope let me ask you a question what are you going to do are you going to leave Allah's rope and go and hang with them on some other rope 
Or you're going to keep on hanging to the rope of Allah, even if you're the only one. Yes? Yes, because Allah said, فَتَسِّمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Hang on to the rope of Allah. And what is this rope of Allah? What is the rope of Allah? This has been explained by the Prophet wasallam in a hadith, an authentic hadith. The rope of Allah is Allah's book. The rope of Allah is Allah's book, which is suspended between the heavens and the earth. The rope of Allah is the Qur'an. It is the book of Allah. And it also by extension is the sunnah. Because the Prophet also said, and this is the holistic approach, when you understand the deen all together, you see there are people who say, we only believe in the Qur'an and we don't believe in the sunnah. And they will use something like this as a proof. No, it's not a proof. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the book of Allah and my sunnah, they are together. And they will not separate until they meet me at the hold, at the pond in paradise. The Qur'an and the Sunnah in coming to under... When we want to understand the deen of Islam, when we want to understand our deen, the book of Allah and the Sunnah come together. We don't separate between them in understanding our deen. Of course the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. But in understanding, in the fiqh of the deen, in knowing how to worship Allah and following the religion, the Qur'an and the sunnah come together. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, I leave you two things, as long as you hang on to them, you will never go astray. The book of Allah and my sunnah. In another narration, when the Prophet ﷺ, he gave a khutbah, a sermon, and the people began to cry, and they began to shed tears. And one man, he stood up, he said, Ya, Rasulullah, it seems as if this is a farewell sermon, so advise us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I advise you to fear Allah, to have taqwa of Allah, and to hear and obey your Amir, even if he is an Abyssinian slave. And after me, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see great ikhtilaf, great differing. So cling to the book of Allah and my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashideen, the rightly guided successors. And bite it with your teeth and beware of the bid'ah, beware of the new things in the religion. Because the new things in the religion, this is what destroys the sunnah. This is what destroys Islam. This is what perverts our deen. When people invent new things in the religion, they invent new ways. They change the deen. They are letting go of the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are abandoning the guidance of Allah for the feeble imaginings of their own minds. So this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us about. Have taqwa of Allah. Obey, obey your Amir. Beware. There will be many differences. And we see so many differences. Don't we see so many differences? Don't we see what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? The Jews and Christians divided into 72 sects. And my ummah will divide into 73 sects. All of them in the hellfire except one. What is that one, Ya Rasulullah? The Sahaba wanted to know. Who is saved from the hellfire? From those sects and those groups that went astray? And the Prophet ﷺ said, that those who are what I and my companions are upon this day. The ones who follow my sunnah, and the sunnah of my companions, what we're upon this day, the day before the people became divided. This is the deen, this is Islam. This is what the aql tells us, and this is what the naql tells us. This is what the text tells us, and this is what the intellect tells us. Both of them agree. Because if you were to ask anyone, even a non-Muslim, ask anyone, who do you think understood the religion of Islam the best? People living today, 1,430 years later, or the people who lived with the Prophet ﷺ, the people 
who saw the, the revelation, they saw the Prophet wasallam sweating when the revelation came to him. They saw the camel when the Prophet was sitting on the camel, it sagged from the weight when the Qur'an was being revealed. The people who saw the Prophet pray, they saw him made, make hajj, they saw him fasting, they heard him reciting the Qur'an. They heard from their own ears his explanation of the verses of the Qur'an. They saw him living the book of Allah. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the living the Qur'an. The living example of how to follow the Qur'an. So who understood? Who do you think logically will understand that message better? The people living with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or the people who came hundreds of thousands of years, or hundreds or many hundreds of years after. Surely, those people, and this is what the Prophet said. So unity, brothers and sisters, must be upon the truth. The truth is the Qur'an. The truth is that which explains the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And those people who best understood the Qur'an and the Sunnah were the companions of the Prophet. That is the people we must look to. How did they worship Allah? How did they believe in Allah? How did they unite? And what did they unite upon? How did they love each other, my brothers and sisters? And this is a topic I would, could talk so long about this topic of unity. I talked about it conceptually. The concept of unity is upon the book and the sunnah. And the reality, my brothers and sisters, is beautiful. We've talked about giving salams. But you know what? Let's look at the five pillars of Islam very briefly. You know, we live in a society that by and large, Western society, they say religion is your own personal affair. It's your own personal affair. But we don't believe that, brothers and sisters. Religion is not just about our religion anyway. Our deen, Islam, is not just about what you believe as an individual. No, we have an ummah. The word ummah comes from um, mother. And we are brothers and sisters. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى Verily the believers are brothers. We are a brotherhood. We are brothers and sisters. We are a family. This is how our religion describes us. Help your brother, whether he is the oppressor or the oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ, help him. You heard what Sheikh Yahya just said, just now. And the story about the Sahaba who used to drink. Help your brother whether he is the oppressor or the oppressed. And they said, the Sahaba said, well, we know how to help him if he's oppressed. But how do we help him if he's the oppressor? The Prophet ﷺ said, stop him from doing his oppression. Help him. This is the brotherhood and sisterhood of Islam because we are the people of La ilaha illallah. We are the people who have decided and chosen to worship Allah, to single out Allah for worship. We have abandoned the worship of idols. We have abandoned the worship of Jesus. We have abandoned the worship of money. We have abandoned the worship of the world and the things of this world. And we have chosen to worship Allah alone and to follow the guidance that has been given to His last messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what unites us, my brothers and sisters. So when you take shahada, when you become Muslim and you take shahada, you have to do it unless there's something preventing you. But you have to do it publicly in front of other Muslims because you're not only saying, I believe that there is one God worthy of worship, Allah alone, and I believe Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You are not only doing that, but you are joining and making a declaration of your intent to join the family, the ummah of the Muslims. You are making that declaration of intent. And that's something you need to remember, brothers and sisters. Those people who have come to Islam, those new Muslims, they have decided to join our family. And we have to look after them and we have to care for them. It's so important. And look at our prayer, our salah. Look how the Prophet ﷺ, how he emphasized the importance of praying in jama'ah, especially for the men. The importance of praying in jama'ah five times a day. Why? What is the wisdom? What is the intent? What is the purpose behind that? 
Because the hand of Allah is over the jama'ah. The hand of Allah, the support of Allah is over the people who are united. And this unity and this being together and this supporting one another is so important. And we should be like one body, my brothers and sisters. That's how the Prophet ﷺ described this ummah like one body. So if one part of this body hurts, if one part of this body suffers, if one part of this ummah is in pain, the whole body is restless. None of us should be able to sleep. None of us should be able to rest. Well, we find the body of the Muslims any part of that body of Muslims is being injured, we should all feel restless. We should all feel disturbed. How can we really claim that we are people of Iman? How can we claim that we are people of Islam? And we don't care for our brothers and sisters in Islam. We don't care for them. We don't feel anything anymore. When they suffer, and this suffering could be physical, it could be physical famine, war, drought, disease. That's one type of suffering. But there's a worse type of suffering, brothers, and that's a spiritual suffering. Ignorance. People far from the deen. People ignorant of Islam. A spiritual death where people have not internalized the Quran. They read it. They make salah. They say... They say the prayers, they make the salah, they fast Ramadan, but it doesn't affect us anymore. Because we have become dead spiritually. Because the deen has become a ritual. It's become part of our culture. And it's not something we feel it anymore. And we find the Muslims practicing magic, practicing shirk, visiting fortune tellers and soothsayers, going to the graves and praying to the dead people. Shirk! Wearing taweez, thinking that these charms and bracelets are going to protect us. Shirk! This is even worse. This is even worse than the physical disasters besetting us. And of course the two, in fact, in reality, brothers and sisters, they come together. The two come together because we are sick. The ummah is sick. So where is the love? If we love each other... We need to support each other. We need to help each other in birr, in righteousness, and taqwa, and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to support each other in doing the good things, al-ma'roof. And we need to forbid each other from al-munkar, from the evil. This is the hallmark, this is the distinguishing characteristic of our ummah. And it's a manifestation of love. If you love someone, if you love your child, if you love anybody, if you see them falling into harm, you will do whatever you can to save them. And you will love good for them, you will prefer them even to yourself. This is the true manifestation of love for another creature. And where is that brothers and sisters? Where is that quality amongst us? Where is that even aspiration amongst us? Because you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. We need to pray together in jama'ah. When we fast Ramadan, we break our fast together. Even though fasting, yes, it's for Allah. But we break our fast together. We're encouraged to feed each other. And hajj. And zakah. All of these things are to do with the community, the body of the Muslims, bringing us together. These are the five pillars of Islam. And each one of these five pillars, my brothers and sisters, has a dimension that is to do with and linked with the bringing together and the unity of this ummah. This nation, this, not this nation, this, this family, because that's how we should think of it. We are a family. Let's be a family, brothers and sisters. Let's really live this aspect of Islam. Let's implement it in our lives. Let's increase this love and this compassion and this kindness towards each other. Let's start by one simple thing. When you see a Muslim, say to them with a big smile, with a big heart, Assalamu alaikum. 
Let's not pass each other by anymore in the streets and in the shopping centers and in the lifts and fail to say to each other, Assalamu alaikum. And don't be afraid. Why should you be afraid? What have we got to be afraid of? We should be afraid of Allah. We should be afraid that Allah will take this love away from us. And this, this nation of Muhammad, we will divide even more. Let's bring back the love, brothers and sisters. Let's bring back the love. If we don't love ourselves, if this ummah, we can't love ourselves, how are we going to spread that love to others? What are we inviting people to? We need to invite people, we have to. It's our obligation, but what are we inviting them to? A family divided, a nation at loggerheads with one another. Love, brothers and sisters, we don't talk enough about love. We don't have enough love. We need more love between each other, brothers and sisters. So, from me, brothers and sisters, for this beautiful conference here, to see all of you here, and may Allah reward so much the brothers and sisters who have made this happen, because these conferences, they are the times when we come together, when we meet each other. We have that opportunity to share and to feel like a family. So from me, my brothers and sisters, for the last time to you, for this year, I would like to say to you, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.